With a smile, hair flip, and sigh, Heavenly Arroyo stood in a Fall River courtroom Monday to answer to a charge of murder. These individuals, known for their stunning looks, have committed heinous crimes that have shocked the nation. From murder to conspiracy, their crimes have left a trail of devastation in their wake. Join us as we explore the shocking details of their crimes, the courtroom drama, and the sentencing that changed their lives forever. Prepare to be captivated as we uncover the reactions of the hottest convicts reacting to life sentences. First up, we have Russell Burrell. A man police say was barely old enough to drive when he gunned down three people in Providence is going to prison for the rest of his life. Russell Burrell, a name that sends shivers down the spines of those who have heard of his crimes. At the age of 17, Burrell found himself at the center of a triple homicide that shocked the nation. But what led this seemingly ordinary teenager down such a dark path? It was the fateful evening of July 30th, 2012, when Burrell, along with his accomplices Timothy DeBrito, Quandell Husband, and Donovan Hall, discussed targeting Michael Michael Martin, a man they believed to be an easy target for a robbery, or as they referred to it, ALIC. Their motive? They believed Martin had a stash of marijuana and money in his apartment. Armed with a fully loaded 9mm Glock, Burrell and his accomplices set out on their mission. The Glock, with its magazine holding 17 rounds and a red laser beam sight, had been passed around within the group before. In fact, DeBrito had used the same weapon just months earlier in a violent altercation. At approximately 10 p.m., Burrell, Husband, and Hall arrived at Michael Martin's apartment. When Martin answered the door, he was met with the chilling sight of Burl pointing the gun directly at him. Without hesitation, the trio rushed into the living room, barking commands at Martin and another unexpected presence, Damien Cologne. The victims were herded towards the kitchen, where Burl unleashed a hail of bullets from the 9mm Glock. Both Martin and Colin fell victim to Burl's cold-blooded actions. As the chaos unfolded, Shamika Barrows, who had been napping on a nearby couch, awoke to the nightmare that was unfolding before her eyes. Realizing that she was in danger, Barrows tried to escape, but Burl turned the gun on her, emptying the magazine clip and ending her life in a tragic instant. Russell Burl's actions that night were not those of a misguided teenager caught up in a bad crowd. They were the actions of a cold-blooded, calculating killer. After the triple homicide, authorities wasted no time in apprehending Burrell and his accomplices. In November 2013, Burrell, who was still a juvenile at the time of the murders, made a shocking decision. He pleaded guilty to three counts of murder, three counts of discharging a firearm during the commission of a crime of violence, and one count of conspiracy. I don't desire revenge, but I do ask for justice and to impose the maximum penalty as the law allows. On each count of first-degree murder, he was sentenced to a life sentence to run consecutively. Additionally, for each firearms charge, Burrell received a life sentence, all to run concurrently but commencing consecutive to the three life sentences for the murders. To further compound his punishment, he was also sentenced to 10 years to run consecutively for the count of conspiracy. As his sentence was read out, Burrell showed no signs of sadness or anger, his expression totally unreadable. To the index tonight in one of the most closely watched trials in the nation, Jody Arias, convicted of murdering her ex-boyfriend, tonight sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Jody Arias. At the Maricopa County Superior Court in Arizona, the chilling case of Jody Arias is being presided upon. Arias, known for her striking looks, became the center of a media frenzy as her trial unfolded, revealing a tale of passion, betrayal, and a brutal act of violence. In this video, we will explore the shocking events leading up to the murder of Travis Alexander, the dramatic trial that followed, and the ultimate sentencing that left the world in disbelief. In the quiet town of Mesa, Arizona, a love story turned into a nightmare. Jody Arias, a woman known for her captivating beauty, crossed paths with Travis Alexander, a charismatic salesman and motivational speaker. Their relationship began innocently enough in 2006, but as time went on, it became clear that their love was anything but ordinary. Theirs was a tumultuous romance, marked by intense highs and devastating lows. Friends and family would later describe their relationship relationship as a roller coaster ride filled with passionate arguments and moments of undeniable chemistry. But beneath the surface, a dark undercurrent was brewing. As the months passed, accusations of stalking began to surface against Jody Arias. Travis Alexander claimed that she would show up uninvited at his home and bombard him with incessant phone calls and messages. The once promising love story had taken a sinister turn. Then on June 4, 2008, tragedy struck. Travis Alexander's life was brutally cut short in his own home. His body was discovered with 
with multiple stab wounds, a slit throat, and a gunshot wound. The scene was nothing short of a horror movie, a chilling testament to the violence that had unfolded. Initially, Jodi Arias gave conflicting accounts of her involvement in the murder. She first denied any knowledge of the crime, but as evidence mounted against her, she changed her tune. Arias claimed self-defense, alleging that Travis Alexander had been abusive towards her. The trial that followed was a spectacle like no other. Lasting several months, it was filled with graphic details that left the jury and the public stunned. The prosecution painted Jody Arias as a cold-blooded killer, meticulously planning and executing the murder. The defense, on the other hand, portrayed her as a victim driven to the edge by an abusive partner. Finally, after months of deliberation, the jury reached a verdict. Jody Arias was found guilty of first-degree murder. State of Arizona versus Jody Ann Arias, verdict count one. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn, and the above entitled action upon our oaths do find the defendant as to count one first degree murder guilty. But the story didn't end there. The penalty phase of the trial resulted in a hung jury, leading to a mistrial. It seemed that the case of Jody Arias would continue to haunt the public consciousness. Ultimately, Jody Arias was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole on April 13, 2015. The court finds the mitigation presented is not sufficiently substantial to call for leniency and that a natural life sentence is appropriate. It is ordered. The defendant shall be incarcerated in the Department of Corrections for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. Next, we head to the Hillsborough County Circuit Court, where Cameron Heron faces sentencing. While the crime he committed was particularly tragic, Heron also gained attention for his extremely good looks. Take a seat in the courtroom as we explore the events that led to his sentence and the ongoing legal battle. Brace yourself for a tale of tragedy, recklessness, and the pursuit of justice. To understand the shocking events that unfolded in Cameron Heron's life, we must first delve into his background and early years. Born and raised in Tampa, Florida, Cameron grew up in a seemingly ordinary family. His parents, Chris and Cheryl Heron, were hard-working individuals who provided a comfortable life for their son. As he entered his teenage years, Cameron developed a passion for cars. On May 23, 2018, Cameron Heron, his brother Tristan Heron, and their friend John Barino engaged in a street race that eventually led to the death of Jessica Raubenault, a 24-year-old mom from Ohio, and her 21-month-old daughter, Lilia Raubenault. The young mother from Ohio was visiting relatives in Tampa that day and had gone out for a walk along the iconic Boulevard. As she pushed her daughter in a stroller, Riesinger Raubenault stepped out to cross the roadway. Heron, who was 18 at the time, was behind the wheel of a Ford Mustang, a graduation gift he'd just received from his parents. Barino drove alongside him in a Nissan Altima. Witnesses said the pair appeared to be racing, weaving in and out of travel lanes as they headed north from Gandhi Boulevard. Witnesses also said the Nissan was slightly ahead of the Mustang, but veered away just as Riesinger Raubenault stepped into the roadway. The Mustang then struck the mother and daughter. Cameron's car was running at 102 miles per hour, which was 2.5 times more than the posted speed limit. The impact was catastrophic, instantly taking the lives of the innocent mother and child. The shockwaves of this tragedy reverberated throughout the community, leaving a trail of grief and heartbreak in its wake. Cameron Heron's life was forever changed in that moment. The once promising young man now found himself facing the harsh reality of his actions. The media frenzy surrounding the case dubbed him the hottest convict, focusing on his physical appearance rather than the grab of the crime he committed. Jessica's husband, David, had some words for him. Shown zero remorse. The truth behind this is that you are privileged. You killed a mother and a daughter. You did. No one else in this city but you did. Cameron. As the legal proceedings unfolded, the nation watched with bated breath. All through the trial, Cameron's face was a mask of indifference, and at no point did he show visible signs of distress or remorse at what he had done. However, his sentencing would disrupt his cool guy demeanor. Vehicular homicide, the court's going to uh, adjudicate the defendant guilty, sentence him to nine years in Florida State Prison. On count two, same charge, the court will adjudicate the defendant guilty, sentenced into 15 years Florida State Prison. Cameron Heron was ultimately convicted of vehicular homicide and street racing, and he received a sentence that would leave him behind bars for a total of 24 years. As the judge read out his sentence, Heron's eyes reflected shock even through his mask. Perhaps the severity of his actions was suddenly dawning on him. 
Jeremy Meeks rose to fame when his mugshot, posted on the Stockton Police Department's Facebook page in 2014, went viral, capturing the attention of millions worldwide. Women were enamored by his striking features, dubbing him the one of the hottest convicts ever. But behind the viral sensation lies a troubled past. Meeks faced legal battles, serving time in federal prison for firearm possession. However, his release marked a turning point in his life. Before Jeremy Meeks became known as a well-known figure, his life was marked by a series of unfortunate events and a path that that led him into the world of crime. Born on February 7, 1984 in Tacoma, Washington, Jeremy Meeks grew up in a tough neighborhood, surrounded by the allure of gangs and violence. As a teenager, Meeks found himself drawn into the dangerous world of the Northside Gangster Crips, a notorious street gang. It was during this time that he became involved in criminal activities that would shape his future. In 2002, Meeks' life took a dark turn when he was charged with robbery and corporal injury to a child. The charges stem from an incident where Meeks assaulted a 16 year old boy, leaving him injured. It was a moment that would change the course of Meeks's life forever. Meeks was sentenced to serve two years in a California prison. It was during his time behind bars that he admitted to claiming membership in the Northside Gangster Crips, further solidifying his ties to the gang. However, little did Meeks know that his life would take an unexpected turn, one that would thrust him into the spotlight and captivate the world's attention. On June 18, 2014, Meeks's life changed forever when he was arrested as part of a gang sweep called Operation Ceasefire. The Stockton Police Department listed him as a convicted felon, arrested for felony weapon charges. But it was his mugshot that would become the catalyst for his newfound fame. The internet was captivated by his striking features, with thousands of people expressing their admiration. However, that didn't stop a federal court judge from sentencing him to 27 months in federal prison. Now out of prison, Meeks has become a well-known fashion model and actor. murdered a well-known makeup artist. Now a local man will spend the rest of his life in prison. At the Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court in Cleveland, Ohio, sentencing is currently underway for William Hammonds. Hammonds, a member of the notorious Heartless Felons Gang, found himself in the spotlight when he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 100 years. But it wasn't just his crime that caught the public's attention. It was his striking good looks that made him a sensation. Take a seat in the courtroom as we explore the details of Hammonds' crime. Williams Hammonds a 24-year-old resident of Cleveland, Ohio, became a household name when he found himself at the center of a high-profile murder trial. But it wasn't just the crime itself that captured the public's attention. It was Hammonds's striking good looks that made him a sensation. With his chiseled jawline and perfectly styled hair, he quickly gained the attention of the public. However, behind his attractive appearance lies a dark and disturbing past. Hammonds was a member of the notorious Heartless Felons Gang, known for their involvement in violent crimes and drug trafficking. The gang operated in the streets of Cleveland, spreading fear and terror throughout the community. Hammond's criminal activities were not limited to petty crimes. In 2012, he was involved in a brutal murder that shocked the entire city. The victim, whose name was Sharon Anderson Norfus, was brutally beaten and left for dead. According to police reports on May 4, 2012, Hammond's used a key fob to get into Sharon Anderson Norfus's Shaker Heights apartment building on Warrensville Center Road. He then sexually assaulted the 60-year-old makeup artist inside her unit and demanded her ATM card and pin. Unfortunately, Anderson Norfus fought to get away and Hammonds strangled her. The evidence against Hammonds was overwhelming and he was ultimately convicted of aggravated murder. The details of the crime were gruesome and shocking. The community demanded justice and Hammonds was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 100 years. It was a punishment that reflected the severity of his actions and sent a clear message that such acts of violence would not be tolerated. While incarcerated at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility, Hammonds continued to make Make headlines. He sent death threats to Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court Judge Michael Astrup, who presided over his murder trial. This act of retaliation further solidified his reputation as a dangerous and unpredictable individual. Hammonds pleaded guilty to one count of retaliation, a third-degree felony, as well as three misdemeanor counts of aggravated menacing, and was sentenced to an additional 36 months in prison. An 18-year-old Fall River woman has been sentenced to life in prison. Next, we have Heavenly Arroyo, an 18-year-old woman who committed a heinous crime that shocked an entire community. Arroyo captured the attention of the media and the public with her striking beauty, despite the brutal nature of her crime. In Fall River, on that fateful day of October 6, 2019, Arroyo stabbed a 68-year-old woman 70 times in her bedroom. The victim, Ana Vasquez Rodriguez, was bedridden after suffering a stroke and had no chance to defend herself. Joined 
join us as we explore the shocking details of this case and delve into Arroyo's reaction to her life sentence. On that fateful day of October 6, 2019, Fall River was forever changed by a brutal act of violence. Heavenly Arroyo, an 18-year-old woman with stunning looks, committed a crime that sent shockwaves through the community. Arroyo had been staying with her great-uncle in the Johnson Street home, where the tragic incident took place. Just a week prior, her mother had requested that her great-uncle take custody of Arroyo, hoping to provide her with stability and support. Little did they know that this decision would lead to a horrifying outcome. The victim, Ana Vasquez Rodriguez, was a 68-year-old woman and the mother of Arroyo's great-uncle's girlfriend. She had suffered a stroke and was bedridden, unable to defend herself against the impending danger that lurked within her own home. The day of the crime started with plans for Arroyo's great-uncle and his girlfriend to take her to New York to visit a relative and obtain some legal documents. However, car problems delayed their trip, causing frustration and impatience to grow within Arroyo. As the day wore on, Arroyo's agitation escalated. Fueled by the mounting anticipation of the trip, her impulsive rage reached its peak. Arroyo retrieved a pair of scissors from the kitchen and made her way to Ana Vasquez Rodriguez's bedroom. The scene that unfolded was nothing short of a nightmare. Arroyo unleashed a frenzied attack, stabbing the helpless victim a shocking 70 times. The brutality of the crime was amplified by the victim's vulnerability. Ana Vasquez Rodriguez, confined to her bed due to her stroke, had no means to defend herself against the relentless onslaught. Her pleas for mercy fell on deaf ears as Arroyo's rage consumed her. During this horrifying act, the only other person present in the home was the victim's grandson. Unbeknownst to him, tragedy was unfolding just a few rooms away. Engrossed in a video game, he wore a headset that shielded him from the sounds of the struggle and the cries for help. After the merciless attack, Arroyo took calculated steps to cover her tracks. She quickly disposed of her bloodied clothing in a nearby dumpster, erasing any physical evidence that could link her to the crime. With a chilling calmness, she approached the victim's grandson, claiming that his grandmother wasn't feeling well. The grandson, unaware of the horror that had taken place, trusted Arroyo's words. It was only when he checked on his grandmother that the full extent of the tragedy became apparent. The sight that greeted him was one of unimaginable violence and loss. In a state of shock, he immediately dialed 911, desperately seeking help. The police arrived swiftly, their presence marking the beginning of the end for Arroyo's attempt to evade justice. Initially, she tried to deflect blame by concocting a story about a masked man fleeing the scene. However, the weight of her guilt proved too heavy to bear, and she eventually made a series of inculpatory, spontaneous admissions while in custody. The trial of Heavenly Arroyo captivated the community of Fall River, as the shocking details of her crime were laid bare for all to see. On the other side, Arroyo, with her striking looks, stood in court, her demeanor betraying no remorse. Heavenly with a smile, hair flip, and sigh, Heavenly Arroyo stood in a Fall River courtroom Monday to answer to a charge of murder. The prosecution painted a vivid picture of the crime scene, describing the frenzied stabbing spree that had taken place in the victim's bedroom. The sheer number of stab wounds inflicted upon Ana Vasquez Rodriguez was a chilling testament to the brutality of Arroyo's actions. As the trial progressed, the defense attempted to shed light on Arroyo's troubled mental state at the time of the crime. They argued that her age of 15 and her mental health issues should be taken into account when considering her culpability. However, the prosecution countered by emphasizing the severity of the crime and the need to protect the community from someone capable of such violence. After careful deliberation, the jury reached a verdict, guilty of second-degree murder. Arroyo was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 19 years. The severity of the sentence reflected the court's recognition of the danger Arroyo posed to society, despite her young age at the time of the crime. We'll begin with a Kenosha teen headed to prison now for the rest of his life. Martise Fuller murdered 15-year-old Kaylee Juga in a surprise attack inside her home. Our final case unfolds at the Kenosha County Courthouse where Martis Fuller is about to be sentenced. It was May 2019 when Fuller, a teenager at the time, committed a heinous crime. We'll explore the details of the crime, Fuller's good looks that caught the attention of the media, and the dramatic courtroom proceedings that led to his life sentence without the possibility of parole. It was a seemingly ordinary afternoon in Kenosha, Wisconsin. On May 9, 2019, Kaylee Juga, a vibrant 15-year-old girl, and her mother, Stephanie Juga, had just returned home from school, excitedly preparing for a family camping trip. Little did they know that their lives were about to be shattered by an act of unimaginable violence. Martise Fuller, a 15-year-old boy with striking good looks, harbored a deep-seated anger towards Kaylee and her mother. He blamed them for his expulsion from school and removal from the football team. Fuller meticulously plotted his actions, displaying a chilling level of premeditation. He enlisted the help of a friend to obtain a gun and ammunition, ensuring he had the means to carry out his deadly intentions. To cover his tracks, 
tracks, Fuller even had a relative dispose of the gun, a move that would later be linked to the crime by the state crime lab. On that fateful day, as the Juga family prepared for their camping trip, Fuller seized the opportunity to strike. With intimate knowledge of the Juga home and Kaylee's daily schedule, he entered through the open garage, undetected. The unsuspecting mother and daughter were upstairs, going about their usual routines, unaware of the impending horror. As Stephanie and Kaylee went about their activities, Fuller lurked in the shadows, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Suddenly, gunshots rang out, shattering the tranquility of the home. In a matter of seconds, Kaylee was shot five times, her life brutally cut short. Stephanie, who came face to face with Fuller on the second floor, was shot twice as she desperately tried to hide from the assailant. The aftermath of the shooting was a scene of unimaginable devastation. Stephanie, wounded and in shock, discovered her beloved daughter lifeless on her bedroom floor. The community of Kenosha was left reeling from the senseless act of violence committed by Martise Fuller. The shocking details of his calculated plan, his intimate knowledge of the Juga home, and the sheer brutality of the crime sent shockwaves through the town. The loss of Kaylee, a promising young girl with a bright future ahead, left a void that could never be filled. As the investigation unfolded, prosecutors painted a disturbing picture of Fuller's obsession with Kaylee. Witnesses testified to his relentless harassment of her at school and work, showcasing a complete lack of remorse for his actions. The trial that followed would reveal the chilling extent of Fuller's dark intentions and the devastating consequences that ensued. Prosecutors wasted no time in presenting their case, painting a chilling portrait of Fuller's obsession with Kaylee Juga. They revealed a pattern of harassment and intimidation that had plagued Kaylee's life, both at school and in her own home. The prosecution also highlighted the calculated nature of Fuller's actions. They revealed that he had plotted the crime meticulously, obtaining a gun and ammunition, and enlisting the help of a relative to dispose of the weapon. The state crime lab confirmed that the gun used in the shooting matched the one disposed of by Fuller's relative, further solidifying the evidence against him. As the trial progressed, the defense attempted to paint a different picture of Fuller, one of innocence and victimhood. His defense attorney, Carl Johnson, argued that Fuller had been unfairly portrayed by the media and maintained his client's innocence. Johnson pleaded with the judge, requesting the possibility of release in 25, 30 years, a plea that fell on deaf ears. The courtroom proceedings took a dramatic turn when Fuller was accused of jury tampering. Prosecutors presented evidence of jail phone calls in which Fuller attempted to contact three jurors, a clear violation of the law. The revelation sent shockwaves through the courtroom, further solidifying the perception of Fuller as a dangerous and manipulative individual, guilty on all counts. The sentencing hearing was a somber affair, with Stephanie Juga, Kaylee's grieving mother, delivering a heart-wrenching victim impact statement. She was such a kind-hearted person, she could light up a room and could always bring a smile to anyone's face. Martise Fuller, ruined it all. In the end, Judge Mary Kay Wagner delivered her sentence, ensuring that Fuller would spend the rest of his life behind bars without the possibility of parole. As we conclude this chilling video of hottest convicts reacting to life sentences, we are reminded of the fact that evil can reside in anyone, regardless of how attractive they look. For more fascinating videos like this, click on the card showing on your screen and I'll be waiting.